Good evening. Thank you, everybody, for coming along. My name is Jackie Hay. I'm a consultant at Morris Hargreaves McIntyre in the United Kingdom. And I just want to thank you for coming this evening, for giving up your evening. I'd also particularly like to thank the British Council for inviting us here to speak. It's a real privilege to be here in Moscow. And I'd also like to thank Garage for providing such a fantastic venue this evening. So tonight, we're going to talk about arts marketing and audience development. Long live the audience. So I've said that my name is Jackie Hay. Uh, my background is I've worked for Morris Hargreaves McIntyre for two and a half years. But before that, I ran the National Audience Development Program for the Arts Council in New Zealand. And before that, I ran a national cultural website about New Zealand culture for the Ministry for Culture and Heritage. And I come from a background of working in marketing and communications teams for festivals. Uh, I've also been a volunteer and um, for arts organisations and been a board member, so quite an eclectic background. Just to give you a little bit of background about Morris Hargreaves McIntyre, we've got 25 years experience in the arts and cultural sector. We've been going for about 18 years as a company. Our head office is in Manchester, but we have offices in New Zealand and in Australia. And we employ a whole range of specialist consultants, researchers, analysts, and project managers, but we're also a full service agency, so we have a t uh, field team of over 100 um, interviewers. And effectively, we're a cultural strategy and research agency. We do more research into arts audiences than any other organization in the world. Uh, we're specialists in segmentation and audience development, as well as market research. Our role, we see our role as helping arts organisations to become vision-led and audience-focused. And that's going to be the focus of our discussion this evening. This is just a tiny sample of some of the clients that we work with around the world. We work in 15 different countries around the world. So first of all, I'm going to start off by telling you a story. So in 1909, um, the famous opera singer Caruso performed at Manchester Trade Hall. The following day, and this is an image of the following day, 40,000 people turned up at, um, in a park in North Manchester to listen to a recording of that performance, which was on a gramophone with a very, very big um, horn, basically, so that they could listen to it. And you can see they're all wearing hats. It's a very formal occasion for them. So a century later, opera is broadcast by satellite with performances beam live around the world, for example, from organizations like the Metropolitan Opera in New York, and they beam it out to, to cinemas across the UK and to all around the world. Similarly, the Bolshoi Ballet um, projects their performances to cinemas all around the world, and they're incredibly popular. So uh, and in terms of other forms of engagement, uh, a number of years ago, the Liverpool Philharmonic performed an entire concert in Second Life. And during the interval of that performance, um, the conductor came and answered questions of people in the audience on Second Life about the performance. So you can see that engagement has changed considerably in the last 100 years. This year, the Royal Academy launched an immersive tour of the blockbuster Ai Weiwei exhibition. It was so incredibly popular that they put the entire exhibition online. And it's the first exhibition ever to be um, captured in photorealistic stereoscopic 3D. So basically, you can go in, you can see all of the collections, uh, you can listen to audio and video from the curator, from the artist, and from uh, famous people like Julian Assange of WikiLeaks, all talking about the exhibition. So it's a fully immersive experience. But the world is changing. This is fantastic. This is uh, a photograph from 1954. And what is in that kitchen is a portable music player. That's how it's described. And obviously, we carry all of that around in our pockets now. But it is also true that for many orchestras, I'm just using that as an example, um, they still resemble the model of a century ago. And they still approach the audience as some kind of sort of distant, respectful group of passive consumers. But their hats have now been replaced by a sea of grey hair. 
And we need to really reconfigure how we engage with our audiences. And it's not just orchestras, there's lots of traditional arts organisations that were developed in very different times where audiences simply sat very passively uh, in the theatre or um, and they um, operate in very different ways now. And if we were to adapt, we're living in a really fast changing world and we really need to adapt to the needs and motivations of our audiences. And um, because the reality is that as arts organisations, we're not really competing with each other. We're co in terms of people's leisure time, we're competing with Netflix, with PlayStation, with sports, with big arena concerts, with cafes and bars and restaurants. So people see their leisure time as doing a whole range of those things and then they also think about engaging in a culture. So we're not competing with each other, we should be all trying to encourage people to engage in culture at large. So there are lots of changes that have impacted in terms of the challenges of the 21st century. We've talked about some of those changes in terms of technology. There's a huge explosion of information, vast choice of leisure pursuits. Um, and now people are expecting to be able to interact and co-curate and um, have a much more participatory experience. And so we need to keep up with those changes. Audiences are no longer they don't expect to sit really quietly and, uh, and passively consume things. They don't expect anymore to just want wander in silent wonder around a museum. They want much more interactive participatory experiences. It doesn't mean that there isn't a place for um, that kind of experience, but they want more engagement. So they're not simply happy just to consume. They're much less inclined to uh, worship at the altar of high art. So if we want to really engage with audiences in the 21st century, we need to think about ways to encourage them to be able to participate, to curate, and to co-create. They're also increasingly interested in making and distributing their own art. And so this is an example that comes from the Tower of London, I don't know if you know this particular installation, it's called Poppies and it's by an artist called Paul Cummins. But actually, while he designed the installation, every single one of those ceramic poppies was made by a volunteer and it's members of the public who planted and installed all of the poppies. So much, much, much more participatory. So as arts organisations, we really need to be working with our audiences to understand what their needs and motivations are, but also to be thinking about how we can engage with them, rather than just doing things to them, working out how we can do things with them. We need to open up to collaborate and to welcome them in. We need to accept that they can be, that we can be, I should say, challenged and inspired. They also want to be challenged and inspired, but the audience's creativity uh, is exponential and we need to try and harness the power of that. And it might actually provoke us to do some of our best work. So this is audiences coming to look at the Poppies installation after it's been um, made by volunteers. And this was an extraordinary installation at uh, the Tower of London which is run by Historic Royal Palaces. It was totally unprecedented. So about two years ago, as part of their audience development strategy and their overall organisational strategy, they decided they wanted a really aspirational target for audiences. So up until that time, that had about four million v visitors across all of their palaces. So historic royal palaces includes the Tower of London, Hampton Court Palace, Kensington Palace, Kew Palace, Banqueting House, and uh, Hillsborough Castle. And as I say, they had about 4 million visitors a year, and they decided that by 2020, they wanted to have 40 million visitors a year. And part of that uh, visitor strategy was that they would include online visitors in that, that they saw them as just as valid as the physical visitors who came to the site, that they would continue to engage with them as much as possible. After this exhibition of the poppies, they think that they have already far exceeded that target of 40 million because it went completely viral. They had to extend uh, the installation. The Prime Minister and the Mayor of London intervened to ensure that the installation could be extended and they had to open it not only for longer in terms of the run but they also had to open it at night so that people could come and see it. It went 
absolutely viral, but a really fantastic example of audience engagement that was participatory as well as people going along to watch it. And afterwards, different parts of the installation are now in other places in the United Kingdom, but many of those poppies were sold to audience members who wanted to own a piece of the installation. So there's been a lot of change in the last 40 years in terms of how cultural organisations have progressed to become audience focused. And I'm going to share with you um, the history of arts marketing in the United Kingdom because even though you are in a very different uh, in a very different funding situation, a very different political background, there's actually quite a lot that you could learn from some of the mistakes that we've made in the United Kingdom, uh, trying to get to the point where we're all audience focused. So first of all, we'll go back to 1947. This is a picture of Clem Attlee, who was the Prime Minister of um, the United Kingdom at the time. Uh, it's the end of the Second World War and he decides that he should set up the Arts Council and that the Arts Council should give out funding to arts organisations to encourage public engagement. So for the first time there's national acceptance that there should be um, of the importance for funding for the arts and that the arts should be subsidised. So during the 50s, excuse me, sorry, during the 50s and 60s the government effectively gave that money to the Arts Council to hand out. There was no sense of judgment about the art that was produced. Uh, people didn't have to report back. They simply got a check regardless of what they did, regardless of whether the art was good and regardless of whether the audience engaged with it or not. So funding was given out, no matter what happened. So then in the 1970s, um, there was kind of a philosophical belief amongst organisations by that stage that had two decades of funding that they absolutely were entitled to subsidised funding from the government, that that wasn't questioned. Earned income was not important for survival at all, and there was huge amounts of artistic freedom, which sounds really fantastic, but people were not interested in audience responses, they weren't interested in insight about the audience, and there was a real lack of hunger for uh, information about audiences because effectively what people were doing, the artistic directors had huge amounts of freedom which was fantastic but they were effectively producing art for their peers. So for example in a museum from a curatorial point of view they would produce the best possible um, the best possible exhibition with incredibly high standards from an academic cura curatorial point of view that would be very impressive to their colleagues but might seem quite distanced and rarefied from an audience's point of view. Um, the offer was seen as inherently desirable. It was believed that whatever the artistic director decided uh, was going to be good was going to be good, whether the audience responded to that or not. Um, marketing was effectively seen as a dirty word. It's not really something that happened. It was defined as promotion, and it was really about giving information about the product and not much more than that. Um, it's also true that at that time, organisations didn't really have particularly strong brands. There's a few exceptions to that, but what that meant was that if you were in the marketing team, then you had to start from scratch for every show or every event, trying to communicate what it was that the offer was, but also what your organisation was. So the organisation effectively in the 1970s remained anonymous. So the real focus in the 1970s was on the product and creating absolute excellence and quality, irrespective of whether that's actually what the audience thought. So we just will make the art and we'll tell them if they come, it doesn't really matter. So then we move to the 1970s, and to be very specific, to the 7th of May, 1979. This is Margaret Thatcher waving goodbye to arts funding. So what happened, um, Thatcher's new right-wing government basically got into power on the back of promising tax cuts for the public. And what's the first thing that happens when you cut public funding? People focus on the arts. So there were massive cuts and funding in the arts, and um, there then began to be a real gap between the income that people were getting and the expenditure that they were having to put out in order to continue uh, producing art. My boss, Jerry Morris, 
was working at the Belgrade Theatre in Coventry at the time, and she said it was extraordinary. Literally overnight, people started to realise that they may not be able to be sustainable as arts organisations. So she used to go into the auditorium in her theatre and think, fantastic, 40% sold out tonight, that's great, it's 5% more than last night, brilliant, job well done. But overnight, the next day she went back in the morning and she realised that is 60% capacity for this theatre that is not sold. I could be selling another, I could be more than doubling my income and my ticket sales. So, so it changed really quickly people's focus. And effectively, it changed people's focus to a really strong selling focus. So um, the first response was to start selling as much as possible, irrespective of whether what was being sold was actually what was happening on stage. So just telling everybody that everything was fantastic and you had to go to everything. So the selling was not aligned to the experience that audiences were necessarily having. And they took the money, they didn't necessarily deliver on their promise, and, but the problem was then that they weren't retaining people. So they might get quite a lot of people coming in the beginning, but they didn't necessarily encourage people to come back because the way that they were selling was a bit disingenuous. It's a very tactical approach to, um, to marketing. Um, there was also very, very little awareness of the market. People still didn't really understand audiences' needs or their motivations, and they weren't really that interested in meeting their needs. They just wanted to sell tickets. So again, very product-led, but selling-focused. And this, what this really meant is that it was all about the needs of the organisation, nothing about the needs of the audience. So then we come to the 1990s, where people started to have much more of a marketing focus. And this partly started to happen because we started to get more information about audiences. We also, with technology, we were able to have uh, box office data. Um, people might have had CRM systems. So we understood a little bit about what people's behaviour was. It also meant that people could do more research and analysis. There was a little bit more focus on understanding audiences. But the primary thing that happened is that people were targeting the people who had already been. So they just kept selling to their core audience, hoping that they would return again and again. But they became so market focused in terms of selling that in fact, the audience and selling to the audience became more important than the art. So lots of things became very mainstream and that idea of, sort of selling tickets to the core audience became the primary focus. And because they were using market research to understand people's behaviour, sorry, because they were using ticketing data to understand people's behaviour, what they understood is that I bought tickets to Shakespeare, therefore I must only want to go to Shakespeare in the future. So then they would c continue to market to me about more Shakespeare experiences. But in actual fact, I could have bought those tickets for my parents for Christmas, or I might have bought them for a whole range of friends, and it might have been the first time in a long time that I'd been to Shakespeare, and I might be interested in all sorts of other things. But what they were doing is going, if you've done this in the past, you will only do this in the future. So it meant that not only were they targeting the core audience, but they were making a very narrow focus in terms of what they would market or um, offer to that audience in the future. Um, they also tried to sort of package up lots of loyalty or subscription schemes to encourage people to keep coming back. But a really interesting thing happened. So they were very inward looking in terms of um, the marketing that they were doing and looking at their databases. But actually what happened in the long term is that selling was, I'm sorry, marketing was very effective in the beginning, but over the long term, audiences actually started to decline because the marketing wasn't convincing people that they should keep coming back. The product was very um, mainstream, and there just wasn't a sustainable audience to keep coming back over and over again. So then in the 2000s, um, we move more to what we're going to talk about for the rest of the evening, which is organisations being vision-led as well as audience-focused. So Thatcher's government had really been questioning elitism in the arts, 
And the deal was that you wouldn't get funding at all unless you could really prove that you were focused on uh, making yourself much more relevant and relatable to your audiences. So because organisations were challenged to become more audience focused, um, that was a really great thing that they ended up having to be much more relevant. So for example, when Tate was applying in the early 90s for funding for Tate Modern, they're just about to open a new branch of Tate Modern. It's been incredibly successful. But they were challenged to, uh, that they wouldn't get huge funding unless they became more audience focused. So effectively, the government kind of forced them to take that kind of approach. And what that meant was that it was actually museums and galleries who led the way in terms of uh, becoming more audience focused. So this is Tony Blair. Um, so by, two, by 2000, um, we've got a left-wing Labour government. They've been in power for three years, and they started to think about how arts could actually be used for wider purposes. So they were really interested in social inclusion and in poverty and crime and social engagement, so how the arts could be used for well-being. So they essentially saw it as a kind of socio-economic tool. Um, and cultural organisations started to realise that they had a much bigger job to do, that they needed to think about diversity, about including communities. They needed to, and in order to do this, if they really wanted to understand the, the nature of their audiences, they really needed insight into their whole range of audiences. So that also meant that they looked at segmentation in order to understand their audiences better and to meet those needs. And they had a really strong remit to engage wider and more diverse audiences. So we're now in a position, back in the 2000s, where we're vision-led and audience-focused, which is the best of both worlds, because Effectively, it means that we can keep our artistic vision incredibly strong. There's no reason why you should ever have to compromise on your artistic vision while focusing on audiences. Art and audiences should be of equal importance in your organisation. And uh, quite often what happens is people presume if you're going to be audience focused that it means you have to somehow compromise on your artistic vision and that's absolutely not the case. What you want to do is to champion both equally. We want to put audiences in joint top position and create something really fantastic, but always consider the audience's needs uh, as we're creating that piece of art. We want to build really strong brands as organisations, and we want to ensure that we build not just that we're not just engaging more audiences, but that we are engaging them more. So we want to build really rich, enduring relationships with audiences. We don't just want them to come once or twice, we want them to feel like they really belong to our organisation, that they feel welcome, that they will come back regularly and that they'll be advocates for us. So we've done lots of research around the world into audiences as I mentioned before and in some of the work that we've done um, this is where uh, organisations in these countries think that they fit uh, in terms of whether they're at the product focused selling point or the selling point or marketing focused or audience focused. And I really love this quote. It comes from Fiona Allen, who's artistic director of the Curve Theatre in Leicester. And she just articulates exactly what I've taken 20 minutes to explain to you, which is that we absolutely need to put audiences and art at the very heart of our organisations. And we talk about this as being vision-led and audience-focused. So I'm just going to tell you a story about an organisation that I think is really fantastic at being both vision, equally vision-led and audience-focused. Um, have you all heard of the Shakespeare's Globe in London? Yep, okay, great. So, to commemorate the 450th anniversary of Shakespeare's birth, they decided uh, that they wanted to create a new project called Globe to Globe, where they would take, sh take a Shakespeare production around the world and perform it in every country in the world, and that they would take two years to, um, to do this around the world. This is a lovely quote from Peter Brook who said that the six simplest words in the English language 
are to be or not to be, and that there is hardly a corner of the planet where these words have not been translated. So you guessed it, they decided that it was Hamlet that they would take around the world because they felt, uh, the artistic director felt like it was the play that would most resonate in a whole range of contexts. So, actually I'm just gonna go back. So they started their tour to go to every nation in the world, but there was one country which they could not visit because they could not get either visas or insurance to go and perform there. Does anyone know? where that was? Can anyone guess? Stunned silence. Okay, it was Syria. So they couldn't go to Syria. They're, they're actually still in the middle of the tour. Um, but they were amazing and they decided they weren't gonna let this get in their way as a barrier to engagement with audiences. So what they decided to do is they performed at a, um, sorry about that noise, um, in a refugee camp on the Jordanian border to an audience made up entirely of Syrians. Which I think it's extraordinary that they went out of their way to find an audience that could mean... So they kind of changed their focus from performing in every um, country in the world to performing for every nation in the world, which is fantastic. So the Zatari refugee camp in Jordan, which is where they performed, um, is a huge refugee camp with about 90,000 people in it. It's actually now the fourth biggest city in Jordan. And it's not the most obvious place for somebody to go and perform Hamlet, but it meant that they could then achieve their vision. So there's graffiti like this all around the camp, and some of it's of an extraordinarily high standard. There's art everywhere. And the graffiti is really one of the very few ways that the refugees have to really express themselves. And I won't show you other photos, but I just wanted to show you that one because I think it's really beautiful. So here's the Shakespeare's Globe team setting up their stage. I show you this photo because they were, they did start the performance outside, but there was a massive dust storm and they had to relocate um, so, sometime into the performance inside. So they came inside and redid the performance and the only thing that was a bit sad about coming inside is they would have performed to thousands outside, but they could only fit about two or 300 people and this kind of ramshackle hut that they used. But most of the people in the audience were kids. And this is a lovely um, image of, um, oop, that didn't work. And what was really great about the company is they didn't just go there to perform. This is them meeting with uh, a drama club that was formed in the refugee camp so that they could basically share ideas and experiences uh, with the refugees. And this is one of the actors teaching some of the kids in the refugee camp to play her mandolin. So at the beginning of the tour, there was no plan to go and perform in refugee camps. But after they had this experience in Syria, they decided to go and perform in other refugee camps. And this is them performing at a very notorious camp called The Jungle in Calais, where they had an extraordinary experience um, performing in the cold. And they decided also to do some audience um, to get some audience feedback. So these are the things that the audience members said afterwards. And it's really good to have something to cheer you up. This changes the mood, it brings us together. The language is very beautiful. This is very good. And I would just add that most people who are at any of the, uh, most people who are the, in the audience at either of those performances didn't speak English. So while they didn't know what was going on and they couldn't necessarily kind of understand the Shakespearean language, they absolutely got the kind of um, the emotional connection of the play. And um, I think that's a really beautiful thing. And apparently there was a, a Guardian journalist at the Syrian refugee camp and she said it was absolutely electrifying to see the audience response to what was happening on stage. So we're now going to talk about some characteristics of what a successful audience-focused 21st century arts, arts organisation looks like. So at Morris Hargreaves McIntyre, we've been employed by a number of arts organisations to help them with their development plans for the future. And as part of that, we've developed what uh, we think are the seven key characteristics of being a successful, sustainable organisation in the 21st century. And we call them our seven pillars of audience focus. So I'm just gonna take you through each of these very quickly. 
Um, we initially started this project uh, with Tate. Um, we developed them with them, and then as we worked on different projects uh, with other organisations, we've developed them further. So they effectively are like a, a blueprint for strategic assessment. And I'm not suggesting that um, all the arts, uh, that all arts organisations kind of meet all of these criteria, but most of the clients that we work with do. And some are better at some aspects than others, or some pillars than others, but I'll take you through them and you might want to think about where you think your organisation or where the organisations that uh, you work with or you attend um, sit on the scale. So the very first one we've talked about a little bit is about being vision-led. And when we say that, for us, that's shorthand for saying that you are equally vision-led and audience-focused. It means that your organisation has absolute confidence in your artistic vision and that you're not scared of the audience, you have absolute confidence in your audience as well as in your vision and you champion the art and the audience equally. And so I'm sure that you recognise lots of uh, organisations in Moscow and in Russia who are vision-led audience, um, who are vision-led organisations. Just going to quickly tell you a story of an organisation that I think is vision-led. It's the Halle Orchestra in Manchester. And there was a concert being conducted by Sir Mark Elder, and pretty much everybody who came to that concert came to hear two very famous pieces of music by Mozart. But the conductor also wanted to perform a much more challenging piece, a much less well-known piece, called Five Pieces by Weben. And even for kind of quite regular orchestra goers, apparently, I've never heard this piece, it's quite challenging. So at the beginning of the concert, uh, what Mark did is he told the audience that he, would ha he had a surprise in store for them. They played the Mozart, they played the Weben, and they played the second piece of Mozart at the end. And then at the end of the concert, he said to them, so I promised you a surprise. The surprise is, we're going to play the Weben again. We're going to reprise it. And he said, it's the end of the concert, really. So if you want to leave, you can. But if you would like to hear the Weben again, I'd like to invite you on stage to come and sit amongst the players and the orchestra so that you can see um, the quite strange notations that they'd had to make in the music in order to play the piece. So um, actually, lots of people stayed and came on stage and they sat on the ground and amongst the players and the orchestra. Um, and apparently it was really fantastic. But the amazing thing is that the following week, the marketing director of the Halle Orchestra got dozens and dozens of phone calls from audience members saying, when are you playing the Weben again? And I think it's really beautiful because he knew it was a really, the conductor knew it was a really difficult sell for the audience and that they probably weren't going to come because of it uh, for the initial concert. But he found a way to kind of sneak it into the concert but also really engage audience members and to help them appreciate it. And I think it's a really beautiful example of being really sticking to his artistic vision and wanting to do something that was quite difficult and challenging, but finding a way for the audience to be able to really engage with it and appreciate it. So uh, another um, characteristic of a successful 21st century arts organisation is that they're brand driven. And I don't mean that they've got a fantastic logo, but that they have a really strong brand in terms of the way that they communicate their essence, who they are, what their DNA is, and that, that when, they're, when they are implementing that brand, that it absolutely informs everything that they do, um, and that they're absolutely true to themselves and their brand, and that their brand is a really strong, assertive, and widely understood thing by their audiences. Uh, we also talk about being interdisciplinary, and when I say that, what I mean is that the organisations, that in their structures and their planning, everything is interdisciplinary. And the really important thing about that is that everybody in the organisation is responsible for audiences. It's not just the domain of the marketing team, but in fact it's the domain of the programming team, of the artistic leadership, of the people who look after the cafe, um, if you've got um, a shop, the people who look after the shop, that everybody in the organisation is responsible for audiences and thinking about and meeting their needs. Um, 
And one organisation that does that incredibly well is Historic Royal Palaces. I mentioned them earlier in terms of the Tower of London installation. They're a very, um, they're a very big organisation. They've got a thousand staff members across six different sites. So you can imagine it's very difficult in terms of kind of communications, but they're absolutely immaculate in terms of having a shared understanding about their audiences. Everybody in the organisation knows what they are trying to achieve, they know what their audience objectives are, they know who their target segments are, they have a shared language across the entire organisation. Marketing, digital, uh, interpretation, education, retail, catering, all of them understand what they're trying to achieve in terms of audiences and know what they need to do to work together in order to try and grow their audiences. So the next pillar is to be outcome oriented and by that what we mean is that um, you absolutely uh, will uh, measure your outcomes, you believe that culture improves the quality of life for individuals, for your audience members and that you are going to actually say that, that these are your outcomes and then you're going to measure the impact that you have. And this is just a really tiny example in terms of being outcome oriented. This is uh, a poster from the National Trust. We've worked with them for a long time. They used to, in terms of their marketing, put out posters like this, which say, this is a historic house. It's open on these days. Come along and visit us. So all they're doing is basically saying, this is our product. Come and see us. In the end, what they did is they did a piece of research to find out what mattered to people, just so to find out what outcomes people wanted, rather than just telling people that they were open. So from that research, they discovered that what really mattered to people was a range of things, but um, one of those things, for example, was um, how people spent their time. And so for some people, they really wanted family time. They wanted to be able to go to uh, properties and have a family experience. So what they did is they completely redesigned all of their marketing materials, they redesigned their entire website, and they broke it up into the um, to basically what they call days out segments, but describing how people can spend their time. So this is another example, uh, which is there were a range of their audience members who just wanted some things to do in their free time, but they wanted that experience to be quite dynamic and quite exciting. So they've basically named all of the properties where people can go and have quite exciting experiences to uh, use in their free time. So that another pillar of um, audience focus is to be insight guided, and by that we mean really understanding your audience through research. And um, we really believe that audience research is the lifeblood of any organisation. And in actual fact, if you want to engage with your audiences, if you want to matter to them, if you want to connect with them, you have to understand them. You have to understand their motivations, you have to understand their needs, because only by understanding those things can you actually truly develop a really strong audience focus. I'm just going to uh, talk to you about a really fantastic project that the British Museum did that shows how um, relentlessly insight guided they are. So we do a lot of work with uh, the British Museum. They do evaluations of all of their major exhibitions and sometimes they work with us and they do what we call a formative evaluation, which is doing research into audiences' expectations and motivations before they design their exhibitions. And so that will inform the design. So this is one of those instances they wanted to do something quite out of the ordinary. They decided that they wanted to reposition themselves as being much more contemporary. And so they decided to have a contemporary art exhibition by Grayson Perry, who's a ceramicist and painter. And the British Museum, they knew that they were perceived as very conventional, very traditional, and this was way out of the comfort zone, for, or way out of people's expectations in terms of what the British Museum might do. So quite a risky project for them. Uh, it was called the Tomb of the Unknown Craftsman, and so they invited Grace and Perry to go through the collection of the British Museum, and what he did is he identified 100 objects in the collection 
that were made by people who were anonymous, so unknown craftspeople, and there were a whole range of objects. And from those objects, he then created pieces in response to them. And so that was the concept for the exhibition. The Guardian said at the time that it promises to be the most fascinating wildly idiosyncratic event of the autumn, which just goes to show Grayson Perry is very famous in the United Kingdom now, but at this point in time, I think this was about eight years ago, he was really not very well known at all. Uh, so in order to tell you the entire story of what happened with the um, research for that exhibition, I'm very quickly going to take you through uh, culture segments. So. One of the ways that you can uh, be more efficient and effective in your audience engagement and in terms of understanding your audiences better is to segment your audiences. So to group them into, um, to put them into groups of people who have shared character traits. And uh, we had done a lot of segmentation systems for organizations like uh, the South Bank Center, for Tate, for the National Trust, for the National Theater, and as we, developed these bespoke segmentation systems, we realized that there was quite a lot of similarities coming out in some of the research that we did. And we realized that it would be really useful for the sector if there was a segmentation system that was developed specifically for arts, culture, and heritage organizations. So long before I came along to Morris Hargreaves McIntyre, that piece of research was done, and the result is culture segments. And I'm just gonna very quickly take you through the segments so you can understand a little bit about each of them. So the segments, uh, there's eight of them, and I'm not suggesting that there are only eight kinds of people in the world, but simply that um, we've grouped them into these eight groups with shared kind of characteristics and traits. Um, if you are interested, um, if you like taking quizzes and you're curious, you could go to the link at the top that says segment me, and you could find out while we're talking uh, which culture segment you are. So I'm just going to take you through very, very quickly, but each of the segments is distinguished by sort of deeply held beliefs that people have about the role that culture plays in their lives. Um, and so it helps us to understand, because if we can understand this, we can understand what it is that people want to engage with and how we might persuade them to engage with us, as well as the kind of experience that they seek when they come to visit us. So when we used behavioral box office systems that could tell us what people had done in the past. What it couldn't tell us is why people engaged and the kind of experience that they seek once they arrive. And this is what psychographic segmentation can do for us. So each of the segments is named for what um, that segment uh, would like to get out of the arts. So for example, essence, uh, people People who are in the essence segment believe that essence is absolutely essential to their lives. They couldn't live without it. And many of your um, organizations will have essence as kind of your core segment because they attend lots of their um, cultural consumers who go to lots of different things. So this is the essence segment. Um, essence segment are incredibly discerning. They are very sophisticated in their tastes. They like to go to lots of different things, but it has to be very high quality. They're very independent minded. They tend to be well educated professionals, not always, and they're highly active um, consumers as well as creators of art. They tend to be leaders rather than followers. They know exactly what they like. They don't want other people to tell them what they should go to. They know exactly what it is that they want to engage with. They're really confident in their own tastes. But quality is really important to them. So they're not necessarily going to go to a kind of community play. They're very wary of amateurism. Things have to be really high quality for them to engage. Engaging them isn't difficult. They really want to engage. They go to lots of different things. So the idea with them is simply to give them the right information at the right time about what's happening in your organization. They hate marketing. They think it's really patronizing. So the key to communicating with them is just to let them know about what it is that you have to offer. They, they'll be very knowledgeable, they'll understand about who your artists are or your composers or your conductors, your actors, your choreographers. So it's really important that you make sure you share that information with them. Um, enrichment is a segment that uh, likes to stay really close to home. They like, they're quite traditional. They like traditional art forms. They're very nostalgic. Um, they really like heritage, but they also like nature and gardening in the countryside. 
they tend to have quite a bit of spare time to engage in arts and culture. They've, quite, they've got quite established tastes, but they really enjoy things that link their interests together. So for example, if there's something where you can experience nature and heritage at the same time, they really like that. And they have um, quite, they like quite established and traditional aspects of things highlighted in communication. So when you're marketing to them, you might talk to them about um, nostalgia, about the traditional aspects of whatever it is that your offer is. If there's some kind of history attached to it, they really like that. Value for money is really important for this segment. And it, they're called enrichment because effectively they want to gain enrichment from things that they love. They're very inner director. They're not that interested in what's fashionable. They know what they like. So entertainment is a segment uh, made up of people who are kind of consumers. They like things that are popularist, uh, things that are very mainstream. They tend to be relatively conventional. And arts and culture tends to be on the periphery of their lives. And when they do uh, decide that they want to engage with culture, it will usually be for some big one-off, spectacular, blockbuster, entertaining event. And partly that's because they've got a huge range of leisure interests. And if they're going to go to something cultural, they have to know it's the one must-see thing of the year. So for them, they're very interesting because they're the only, one of the only segments that likes marketing. And for them, the more marketing that they can see about an event, the more it appears on TV and is on billboards all over the place, if it's all over social media, they see that as an endorsement. And particularly if they see a very um, expensive campaign, they think, wow, that must be, they've spent a lot of money on this campaign, this must be the thing to see. And so they like, they like marketing if they think that it's the, um, the thing to see for the year. They don't particularly want to be seen to veer away from the crowd, so they're going to go to see the thing that everybody's telling them that they want, that they should go and see. So expression is a really fantastic segment. They're very receptive, they're very confident, they're expressive, they're very community focused. And the reason why they're a great segment is because they like to go to lots and lots of different things. Uh, uh, they're quite similar to Essence, they consume a lot of culture, but actually they will go to a whole range of things. So they will go to a community event or an amateur event, They'll, they've got really eclectic tastes, they'll try lots of different things. They're very confident and fun-loving, and um, they really like belonging to something. So they're really um, a great segment because they'll also, they really like, they're very social and they like sharing. So if they like something, they'll, br they'll tell lots of other people and they'll bring them along. So they're quite, um, they're a good segment to, um, to really activate because they will spread the word if they, if they like your organisation and they like what you've got on offer. They really like opportunities to debate and discuss. They really like having access to artists and art. So any um, behind the scenes tours or Q&A with artists, they really love those kinds of things. Things need to be really authentic for them. So stimulation, another really great segment. So stimulation are very active, they're experimental, they like to discover new things, they like to be at the cutting edge, they like to be the first to know about things. So they're highly active, they live their lives to the full, they're looking for new experiences, and they want to break away from the crowd. They don't want to do what other people are doing. They want to be the first to find out about something, and they want to be the first to tell everybody else about it. So for them, marketing, they can like marketing if they think that a marketing campaign is very cool or hip, and they think it's a bit of an art form in itself, then they will tell everybody about that marketing campaign because they want to be in the know. And so they'll spread the word, and it could go viral. But they have very kind of high standards when it comes to things like marketing, but if they think it's cool, they'll tell lots of other people. Uh, and so because they like to know about things first, they also, they're very social, so highlighting the social elements of an event is really important for them. They really like social media, like Twitter and Facebook. So um, sort of leaking inside information to them on social media is a really good way to engage them. Sorry about my ring. Uh, Affirmation is a segment that's um, really aspirational. They like quality time and learning and trying to improve themselves. So while learning is really important to them, they also really like fun. So if you can highlight both aspects of trying to have fun and uh, being able to learn or improve yourself as part of the experience, then that's really fantastic for affirmation. Release is a segment uh, who are really 
busy, they've got lots of competing priorities in their life. It might be because they're really busy at work, they might have a young family. They're a little bit wistful about the arts and culture. Um, so it might be that they used to engage in culture quite a lot, but now they just don't have time. It's really important for them that things are easy, that it's easy to find out about things, that it's easy to attend an event, and that you can sell it to them because they might be able to also make it a family event or they can socialise and relax while they're going to an arts event. Uh, for them, their priorities are close to home, so uh, it really has to be quite a compelling offer for them to engage. You have to make it really easy for them. Perspective uh, is a very settled and focused and self-sufficient segment. Um, they are very interdirected. They love learning and reading. And arts and culture are kind of lower among their priorities. They do have a bit of a spontaneous nature, and so they can just decide at the last moment to do something. They need to make their own decisions so they don't want to be influenced by other people. And so the idea is to really kind of respect their individu individuality and try and subtly encourage them to explore what it is that you might have an offer. So these are all the countries around the world that are using culture segments at the moment. Um, th these are places where we have done uh, big pieces of market research and analysed the market for culture as well as the breakdown of segments in each of the countries, but there are actually other countries in the world where people are using culture segments um, just off their own bat. But just coming back to the British Museum, so as I mentioned, Grace and Perry, very, very risky prospect for the British Museum, not a place that was is traditionally associated with having a kind of uh, quite boutique contemporary art exhibition. So they wanted to do a range of things with this um, exhibition. They, these are some of their objectives. They wanted to reposition themselves, but they also wanted to grow some audiences that were not very big in the British Museum audience. So stimulation was an, um, one of the segments that they really wanted to target. They really wanted to engage audiences in London. And as I mentioned before, they wanted to encourage the British Museum to be repositioned as an organisation that could show contemporary art. So we did some research with the British Museum and it turned out that at that point in time, actually not many people recognised Grace and Perry. The one segment that did seem to know who Grace and Perry was, was entertainment. But then interestingly, when we asked if they were interested in going to a Grace and Perry exhibition, entertainment were completely uninterested. If you notice there, there's no pink line anymore. Entertainment did not want to see a Grace and Perry exhibition at all. So um, this is Grace and Perry um, actually in front of one of the pieces that he developed. Um, so the approach that they made, they decided that their um, target segments would be expression. They wanted to grow stimulation in essence. And so what they did is they tailored the message according to what we learned from the research. So expression were not that interested in Grace and Perry, but really liked um, the craft aspect and also very um, supportive of the British Museum, so that's what that focused on. With stimulation, they really focused on the experimental nature of the work and the fact that Grace and Perry is quite, um, quite a contemporary artist. And then with essence, they kind of, um, they mixed it up so that it talked about both Grace and Perry and the quality of the British Museum. So they tailored the messages for each of the segments. And this was originally what they were thinking of using for some of the imagery, but after they did the research, they went to something like this. So you can see that what they did is they targeted particular segments and then they differentiated not just their messages, but also their marketing and their imagery. And then um, this is what the poster looked like. And and one of the really big challenges for them was to get stimulation to come along because stimulation just didn't really see themselves as audience members for the British Museum. And they did a whole range of things, but I'm just going to tell you about this one particular thing that they did. So because stimulation really liked to sort of be first and in the know and to do quite quirky experimental things, they stayed open late on a Friday night and they had, a, uh, this is actually before the, um, or just as the exhibition opened, Pardon me, they had a silent disco in the exhibition space. So they did a lot of promotion on Facebook and Twitter to try and encourage um, 
stimulation to come along, they really highlighted the social aspect of it and also the fact that it was open late, which doesn't normally happen. And it turned out that they sold 5,000 tickets to this event. Now, Grace and Perry wasn't there at the silent disco, but all these people came along, lots and lots of young people who'd never been to the British Museum before, all listening through their headphones to their own music while dancing. Um, in the exhibition space. And just because it was a really quirky, interesting, kind of unexpected thing to happen at the British Museum, so you had hundreds and hundreds of people text, uh, sorry, not texting, but texting, but also tweeting from the British Museum saying, amazing, I'm at the British Museum, it's midnight, and I'm at the Grace and Perry exhibition, and I'm at a silent disco. And it was just, it was a beautifully kind of crafted thing to appeal um, to stimulation. Um, so for expression, they also really focused on the um, craft side of things and also providing access to the artist. So this is a video that they developed. But I'm just going to quickly take you through the results. So they had, this is a very small exhibition uh, compared to um, a lot of the other things that were on at the British Museum at the time. But they increased their Facebook likes by 85%, their Twitter followers by 65%. So a huge increase in terms of digital, and brilliantly, their word of mouth recommendations increased by more than 50%. Their London-based visitors, so you remember that was a target audience, increased by 50%. Now what's really interesting about this exhibition is in the beginning, they were so worried about the risk of it that they were thinking that they might not charge for the exhibition, that they might make it free. They decided after the research that they would charge for it. Um, their target was 60,000 tickets, and they sold 112,000. So they nearly doubled their target. But you can imagine that's a lot of money that they have made uh, compared to if they hadn't um, charged for entry. Their merchandise sales, they were very clever about what they did, uh, were 500% above target. All of the events that they had associated with it either reached capacity or had to be increased. So that's just a really nice example how using insight can really drive um, success for an event or exhibition. So coming back to the pillars, the next one is um, interactively engaged. And so by what, what, what we mean by that is that as an arts organisation, you're committed to building rich relationships. You're having a continuous two-way exchange with your audience. And, but that also means that you're equally being interactively engaged with your partners and your stakeholders. So this is a nice quick example of being interactively engaged. So uh, the Royal Opera House was staging a film event of Romeo and Juliet by the um, Royal Ballet. And um, they decided that they wanted to engage people who'd never been to ballet before, and they also wanted to reach a younger audience. So they worked with an organisation called A Younger Theatre, and they invited six uh, young people in who'd never been to ballet before. They gave them complete access to behind the scenes. They introduced them to various um, members of the staff that they could interview. And then, while watching the filmed performance of the ballet, they allowed them to take over the Twitter feed of the Royal Opera House so that they could tweet their responses to the screening, which I think is a really um, lovely uh, example of audience engagement. So the last pillar is um, personalised. So we, we can't obviously personalise something for every audience member, but we want each audience member to feel like they're really engaged by us and we need to try and optimise both our offer and our marketing um, as much as possible, because you know that we all feel much closer to an organisation when we feel like they know something about us or they're, they're meeting our needs. So if you would like to um, read a little bit more about the seven pillars, uh, you can go to that web address and you can read the full insight required um, thought piece on our website. going to quickly skip that because we're running out of time. So we're just going to take, we've talked a lot about audiences and the market for arts and culture. I'm just going to take you through very quickly what we mean by the market when we talk about the market for culture. So I'm just wondering uh, if you know what the market for theatre is 
in Moscow. So what percentage of the population do you think has been to the theatre in Moscow? Would anyone like to take a guess? 20%? What else have we got here? Less than 2%. Less than 2%. Wow. Anyone else? Um, until about four hours ago, I actually didn't know the answer to this question because usually you have to do quite a big um, population survey to know the answer. But the answer, you'll be surprised to learn, is 66%. Um, I'm not going to go through the rest. but um, So this is uh, the market for arts, culture, and heritage in the United Kingdom. And all the different art forms that we include in the market for culture are uh, along the bottom. So um, just to highlight that we include cinema in the market for culture as a definition of culture. And when we talk about the market, and in order for, to do this research, we don't just ask people what they've been to, we also ask them what they haven't been to but would like to. So that blue graph shows you what percentage of the population in the United Kingdom has been to each of those art forms in the last 12 months. The green shows you who has been in the last three years. So you can see when you ask a slightly different question, that actually that doubles the market. And in fact, not everybody goes to one particular art form or even one organization every month or every year. And actually, people can feel like they really strongly belong to an organization or they're really supportive of it without necessarily going once every two years. Um, so the light green is the people who have ever been to that art form. So there you've got the people who have ever been to any of those art forms. And the orange is people who have never been, but have said they would be interested in going. So you can see that when you think this is your audience, and you ask a question in a slightly different way, the audience, the potential audience, the current audience and the potential audience is much bigger than you actually think. Oh, sorry, and the pink line is for specialists, so like researchers and academics, people like us who work in the sector. And the other thing I wanted to share with you, uh, we talked about this a little bit before in terms of we're not really competing with each other for audiences. It's not about trying to defend our own market share for our organisation. We're actually in a shared market and we should be trying to encourage people to attend culture, not just to attend our, to attend our art form, not just to attend our organisation. I'm going to quickly skip through these. So um, I'm just going to quickly talk to you about the spectrum of audience engagement that we developed, and then we'll have some questions. Let's very quickly take you through that. So we talked before about how there's been lots of changes in society and in the world, and we're seeing the real democratization of culture and how people are wanting a much more participatory experience. So this big move towards interaction, curation, co-creation. So we've been working with organisations all around the world and uh, as part of that work we've developed this model, it's actually incredibly hard to read, I think it's been distorted, so I won't spend too long uh, talking about it. But effectively what the model shows is how the cultural sector has evolved. So at this end, um, sorry, at this end of the spectrum you've got organisations that are just delivering, so we're effectively delivering culture to their audiences with a kind of single authoritative voice. And as you move along the spectrum, um, you move much more towards participation to co-creation and to empowerment until you get into a truly two-way exchange with the audience. And we call this the spectrum of audience engagement. We initially developed it for museums and galleries, but this particular spectrum is for the performing arts. So again, the spectrum and everything that we've talked about tonight is all about responding to the changing world that we live in. And to be truly successful as arts organisations in the 21st century, we need to be unequivocally vision-led and relentlessly audience-focused. Thank you very much. <laughs>